Hello, this is Mrs. Simmons. I am here to talk about some background information for Wyatt Sargasso C that should help you as you begin to read this novel. So let's go ahead and get started. So as you'll remember, uh, this is some metafiction that has ties to Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. So there were a few ties and changes that I should bring up here. So the first thing is that Rees has played with years in her novel, Wide Sargasso Sea. So Jane Eyre is actually narrated in 1818 or 1819 about events that take place between about 1798 and 1808. However, she has this novel set, and by she I mean Jean Rees, has this novel, Wide Sargasso Sea, set in the 1830s to 1840s. So she's played with years a little bit. And then she also purposefully never mentions Mr. Rochester's name. He is really just the husband, although it is very clear that this has ties to Jane Eyre. In fact, she wrote to a friend, Jean Rees did, that she, quote, carefully hasn't named the character at all. Take that as you will, might be interesting discussion there. I also wanted to show you a map here of the Caribbean and where some of these places were located. So the first thing is that yes, it does begin in Jamaica, and that's about right here. They go on their honeymoon, and much of the second part of the novel is taking place in Dominica over here, and then eventually they make it all the way back to England at the very end. Now, you need to know a little bit of information about the colonies as well. So Jamaica was an English colony captured from the Spanish in 1655 and became a British colony in 1670. Martinique, which is not actually a setting but is mentioned every now and then, was a French colony. So then we have to talk about Dominica. You need to remember that England and France were kind of um, enemies at this time, didn't really get along, especially in the Caribbean. So Dominica passed back and forth between France and England for the entire second half of the 18th century. But at the time of the novel, it had been sold by France in 1805 back to England for about 12,000 pounds or so. So then, when we are in Dominica, they are near Massacre, Dominica. Quite a morbid name there. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background information from this as well. This was a fishing village that was named after a treacherous murder in 1674 of about 60 to 70 Carib men, women, and children, including a man named Thomas Indian Warner. And he was supposedly the half-Carib son of one of the foremost English colonists in the West Indies, Sir Thomas Warner, who was actually the governor of St. Kitts. Indian Warner and his Carib allies were killed by his half-brother, Philip, the legitimate son of Sir Thomas. Raised by his father, yet mistreated by his stepmother after his father's death, Indian Warner chose to live with his mother's family, so the Carib side of his family, becoming a Carib leader who often negotiated between the English and the Caribs. Now, this is actually pretty significant because it represents some history and mythology that shows that Indian Warner didn't really fit into either side. He wasn't really Caribbean, he wasn't really British, and so it shows this kind of idea of alienation that really plays out throughout the novel. Additionally, we have to talk about slavery when it comes to the Caribbean. England um, has a darker path away from slavery than a lot of people think. So England did end its slave trade in 1807, but slavery itself was not actually abolished until Britain's parliament approved the Emancipation Act in 1833, which actually outlawed slavery in Britain and all of its colonies. So one of the things we have to understand is, okay, they ended slave trade, but not slavery right at the same time. So the act took effect a year later in 1834, and between 1834 and 1838, former slaves in the colonies were forced to work under a so-called apprenticeship system, after which slave owners were compensated monetarily for each slave, considered to be property, the slaves themselves received no actual compensation for being treated like cattle. It's pretty gross here. Now, the apprenticeship period really wasn't much different from slavery, and in fact, times was worse. So while the former masters were required to provide those laborers with food and clothing and housing and medical care and even could give land to them, um, those apprentice laborers were not free to choose their employers or even to negotiate wages at all. So it was really just a new form of slavery, and the punishments were severe and even sometimes worse than during slavery. Additionally, sugar planters, because there was a decline of sugar production, began a campaign disparaging black labor and calling for importation of indentured laborers. 
This led to the characterization of black workers as lazy, although historical evidence absolutely shows that after emancipation, the ex-slaves were very productive, many becoming small proprietors and landholders, and really contributed to the diversity of the economy there. But they were characterized as lazy, so when you read through the book you will notice that uh, idea being thrown around. Additionally, we should note that a popular white apology for and defense of slavery was that African societies acquired or sold slaves that were recent prisoners of war, thus not considered part of their society. So a lot of white colonists would actually go out of their way to say, yeah, well, they were selling them, so it's not really our fault. Yeah, it's totally your fault if you were actually participating in slavery. So this is a two-way street here. But that was apology, an apology that they would often try and use. Another thing you need to understand is that what Antoinette experiences in White Sargasso Sea is very real, the idea of being an outcast as a white woman. So the Jamaican population census of about 1844 shows that out of 377,433 people, only about 4% of them identified as white. That's a very small number and really does contribute to this idea of alienation for Antoinette. Now, Jean Rees as well, when she grew up in Dominica, only 1% of the population was white, so it really lends itself to white people being outcasts. Now, there are some very important terms that you should probably know when you go into this novel as well. One of the first terms that you should know is maroon. So in Jamaica, this referred to runaway slaves and their descendants who escaped to the mountains and lived free in very small communities, and they were very successful with guerrilla techniques. So the concept, the term, actually comes from Spanish cimarrones, which means wild and untamed, or for, from uh, marrano, meaning wild boar. And then another word you should know is colored. Colored means of mixed racial ancestry, so white and black, Anglo-European and African. So we may have heard it with, say, to kill a mockingbird, just think black person. But here it's actually mixed race. Another important term is the word Creole. So at the time of the, the novel, this term was used in the British Caribbean islands to refer to those of English or European descent that happened to be born in the Caribbean. So technically white people. The term has a variety of contradictory meanings though, especially as our language has grown and changed and language in the Caribbean has. So it originally referred to those of Anglo-European descent born in the colonies, so white people, uh, and used to be used to indicate racial purity. But the term was also used to refer to slaves and animals that were locally born rather than imported from another country. So they eventually added the adjective white to distinguish white and black Creole Caribbeans. And then beginning in the 19th century, Creole was used to indicate racial mixture rather than what I had over here, colored. Um, and it also showed a, a mixture of these two cultures in general. So that's why we see in, say, Louisiana, there's Creole food. It's a mix of different kinds of foods and languages and things like that. Um, additionally, you should know that the British who were from England were rather um, discriminatory against even white Creoles. So they believed that Creoles, in the original sense of the word, had been tropicalized, which means they were emotionally high-strung, they were lazy and sexually excessive. Now, this became a problem because they needed to marry Creole women to Englishmen, so Thomas Atwood wrote a refutation to that belief, the tropicalization of people, in 1791. Another word you need to know is patois. So it's a French word used in English to refer to any dialect that develops out of contact, contact between two different languages, colonizing people such as the British, the French, and the Dutch, and that of a colonized people such as West Africans or the Native Americans. It's often used as well derogatorily, implying low social status of the speaker and the dialect. Interestingly, patois becomes a pidgin language when the children start speaking that as their adopted language. Uh, another one is Sleeping in the Moonlight. This shows up in the novel, and it refers to the belief that looking at the full moon or sleeping under it would cause madness. So the term lunacy, luna, moon, originally described a kind of insanity that was interrupted by lucid intervals that was supposedly influenced by the lunar phases. Another one is Anansi. This comes up once in the novel. This is derived from West African and Car Caribbean tales. Uh, Anansi is sort of a demigod that's cunning, a, a cunning and greedy spider who can take on different forms and who succeeds not by strength but by trickery. 
Another term you need should know is primogeniture that shows up with the husband in this novel. So this is patrilineal inheritance. This is where all that a father owns is passed to the eldest son. Uh, it was considered, especially in England, as essential for the continuity of aristocracy, the British constitution, and English culture. However, typically, fathers did make sure that they settled some portion of their estate for younger sons and daughters, but younger sons often married heiresses to support themselves. This is obvious in Jane Eyre, where it's revealed that Rochester receives £30,000 through an arranged marriage with Bertha, and here in White Sarkasso see that's Antoinette. Uh, another term that you should know is the Married Women's Property Act of 1870. Now you'll note the date on that. It's not in effect for Wide Sargasso Sea. Before the act, a wife's personal property before marriage became her husband's absolutely. Unless it was settled in a trust and that didn't happen very often. So the husband had full control of everything that belonged to his new wife. Whether they lived together or not, whether he treated her poorly or abused her or cheated on her, it didn't matter. What was hers was truly absolutely his, and they, she had no control over it. And this becomes a problem in Wide Sargasso Sea. Now, we also need to talk about African spiritual connections. Uh, they brought a lot of their own beliefs to the colonies. So, three terms here we have voodoo, obeya, and sucreant. Voodoo, you've probably heard of, um, where it really uses poisons and offerings like dried flowers and blood, things like that. Uh, it was often overlaid with Christian symbolism, and it was really adapted to kind of get away with it in a more Christian area in the Caribbean. Obeya is very similar to voodoo, actually. It's a system of beliefs and practices, again, African in origin, in which the practitioner does things for their client to help or hurt enemies of the client. It's often associated, again, with voodoo and zombies. These people who practiced Obeya also had a lot of influence in slave communities and received a lot of attention from white legislators that it was evil, it was bad. Um, so they often believed that people who practiced Obeya were incited by the devil. Another term that's used in this is sucreant. This is a legendary blood-sucking creature, usually female. It travels by night as a ball of fire, but looks like an ordinary person by day. So think something like a vampire. And then the last one that I really wanted to talk about here is the zombie. And I know that sounds kind of silly because zombies are sort of a big deal in modern pop culture, but this is actually really important for the novel here. So if we see a zombie as a person whose soul has been stolen or put to sleep by a sorcerer, and that sorcerer takes full command of the body for his or her own purposes, that becomes a very powerful metaphor for slaves, where their soul is stolen by others and they are forced to work for this sorcerer. Um, again, it is tied to voodoo. Zomb zombies were often considered created by tetrodotoxin, which is derived from pufferfish, uh, and it puts them in a catatonic state, sort of like death. Uh, when they are given the antidote and kept in isolation, they become mm -hmm. a, a zombie. They're disoriented, amnesiac, one of the living dead. Um, another symbolic part of this is that a zombie is usually given a new name, and we actually see this in White Sargasso Sea as well. So, those are some background pieces for White Sargasso Sea. I hope you find it very useful. If you have any questions, as always, contact me. Thanks, guys!